William Leonard Picard's The Rose of Paracelsus on Secrets and Sacraments is nothing short of a literary masterpiece. For those unfamiliar with Leonard Picard, he is currently in federal prison, serving out two consecutive life sentences without the possibility of parole. He was arrested back in 2000 for allegedly manufacturing LSD at a defunct missile silo in Kansas. Incarcerated for a non-violent drug conviction, he has already completed nearly 20 years in maximum security prison, and during that time, he wrote the Rose of Paracelsus on paper and pencil, despite the hellish circumstances. My name is Kat, and I'm currently producing an upcoming serial podcast called The Rose Garden for the Psychedelic Salon. This summer, I was fortunate enough to travel across Europe and interview a wide variety of people within the psychedelic community, many of whom will be contributing to the Rose Garden podcast over the next couple of years. I spoke with some of them at Breaking Convention, Europe's largest conference on psychedelic consciousness, held at the University of Greenwich in London. So, uh, Liam Leonard Picard is somewhat of a heroic character, I think, is... uh a victim of a very out-of-date legal system, um, a man who, uh, I think with best intentions, was very much a, a freedom fighter for cognitive liberty and um, a, a psychedelic martyr. I, I don't even get me started on the moral and ethical position there of uh, an, an innocent man with a victimless crime scapegoated and demonised in this way because it fits the political agenda of an archaic right-wing system that just cannot understand pharmacology or people or clinical medicine or indeed society and culture. You know, he's always been one of those controversial figures in the um, underground history of the United States. This is William Leonard Pickard. This is the um, missile silo bus. This is the alleged LSD chemist of uh, quite some um, uh, skill and notoriety. I feel like I've known him a very, very long time and he's a very easy and nice person to get to know. Uh, and anything I can do to help him, given his circumstances of being locked up for two consecutive life sentences for a nonviolent offense, and that's a phrase I'm going to repeat many times because it's very important for people to understand and to remember and to recognize that this man's life was taken away for allegedly a violation of the law for something that did not involve harm or violence to another human being. In fact, it involved harm or violence to no one. William Leonard Pickard is a unsung hero of this world and he's currently serving a life sentence in jail for alleged work that is there to serve humanity. And he's written an amazing book on paper and pencil inside that prison. An actually extraordinary book. I met with Carlo Rovelli in Lisbon, Portugal. Carlo is a leading theoretical physicist and the founder of loop quantum gravity theory. I think the, the, the Rose is a, it's truly a unique book. Um, it's a, a, an extraordinary book for the way it is written, first of all, um, with this uh, extraordinary rich and uh, uh, profound language full of resonances, full of things. Uh, um, but much more for what, uh, what is inside. It's not an essay, it's not really a novel, it's a, a strange story which I think is neither real nor uh, imagined. Uh, it's both at the same time. Uh, it's a, a description of reality from a different perspective in a sense. Uh, One thing I really like that was posted on Leonard's um, Twitter was a question about the cover of the book because it looks like there's this liquid stain and he asked like you know oh I wonder why there's this liquid like still on the cover of the book and I really feel like there is this intentional exploration of the way that language affects consciousness and that so it's like the book is itself steeped in acid in a way and so by reading it and kind of going into it with that trust and openness to the ambiguity of the style that it does really have a profound impact on you once you kind of get carried along far enough on that narrative so I just like to yeah encourage people to, to stick with it and talk about it and unpack it because there's a lot going on there it has layers and layers one on top of the other one. This, the part which obviously uh, 
and fantasy, but even those, in their own way, are, are, are profoundly real. It's a marvelous book because it's a book of ideas, it's a book of knowledge, it's a book of uh, description of how the mind can see the world, and uh, even more, it's a book that uh, illuminates um, aspects of reality, of the world, uh, of humans, um, uh, deeply and from a beautiful uh, perspective which is deeply moral, deeply ethical, uh, with a profound sense of compassion for humanity and appreciation of the complexity of the beauty of life. It's a unique book, it's a fantastic book. So it's this enormous, sprawling, kind of epic book, you know, there's a few things um, a few pieces of text that I've read, both kind of, uh, uh, I think it's probably Storming Heaven is one maybe example of that, maybe Acid Dreams, like these kind of big grand narrative things. But this is very different, this is a grand narrative from an individual perspective. And it has such a, a beautiful blend of um, the poetry and the science and the politics and the religiosity and all of these things together in it. Um, I think that there are bits of psychedelic literature that do the poetry side of things really well. There are bits of psychedelic literature that do the kind of personal experience thing really well. And there are bits of psychedelic literature that do the um, kind of scientific, analytical stuff really well. And I think the thing for me about The Rose is that it weaves these things together in the most remarkable way. It kind of plaits all these strands together through the lens of the story of um, Leonard and the Six. It's unique because it's the only psychedelic piece of literature there is that is, it's a story, it's not about what I did um, or personal experiences and it's, it's an incredible story and much of it is based on truth and some is, I hope not, <laughs> but it's, it's, it's an incredible book. And uh, it's a great work of literature, and to, I constantly am going to my, checking things up on Google, saying, is this really this guy that he's describing? Is this really this character? I look up, and yeah, he certainly was the, you know, Russian head of drug control and policy, and, and warlords, and uh, professors. It's, I mean, it's, it's an extraordinary book. So. The book The Rose is uh, it's such an interesting piece of work, partly because of who it was written by and the way in which it was written, and it was written in prison, and um, the story itself, you know, un uncovering this really fascinating, hidden, clandestine community. Um, great that this has been brought to people's attention. Um, it's interesting as a reader to wonder how much is true and how much is fiction and how those two things weaving around one another. Um, can't wait for the film. People wonder whether the story of the book is true or false. Um, I think it's, uh, it's very much both. Um, it's definitely uh, profoundly true. I mean, there's no reason to doubt that this is a real story and at the same time it's obviously enormously exaggerated in the way of being presented. There, 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 there are details which are clearly uh, imagination. But this is not falsity. It's a way of uh, uh, presenting aspects uh, of reality from a larger perspective, in a sense, uh, from a deeper perspective. Uh, if you've not been trained to read literature and you're not familiar with that kind of Victorian style of writing, it can seem very obtuse and inaccessible, but I think that there's a lot of really important ideas and a lot of beautiful wisdom in those the way that it's presented and that the, the way the style of it allows for once you get into it and kind of pick up the, the feel of it, you're brought into this world and you go through these experiences as the protagonist goes through them and then by the end of it, it's like, and in a way I, I read the book, and this is something I haven't talked to anyone about, but I read the book as, because the, the first, most of it, 90% of it is before the lead up to letter going to prison. And all of that, in a way, for me, is preparation to understand what happened in those final pages. That you needed to have gone through and walked by his side through all of these transformative adventures in order to see why he made certain decisions and why things fell out in the end. And you need to have 
patience for that and you need to be able to kind of like trust that the narrative has a reason to seem so obscured of you. And I think that talking about it and helping people access that level of it will be helpful in, in kind of getting the message out and sharing it. The power of the whole package of the story, of the book, of the way it was written, uh, moved me so deeply that I struck up a relationship with Leonard through email correspondence, occasional phone calls, and then uh, was honored to take part in the, the whole podcast project. I was asked to be involved, and I leapt at the opportunity. I thought it was a great honor to uh, be able to read something of this book. I was extremely flattered, to be asked to be involved. Um, uh, I'd, I'd been exchanging a few emails with, with Leonard over the years anyway, and then the book came out, and I got sent a copy, and um, I was then very flattered to be asked to read a couple of chapters. Um, it's a great piece of work, um, and I support not just the dissemination of this book and story because of what it is, but I think we need to draw attention to this, the Leonard's plight. I mean, Leonard, like many, many people around the world, are essentially prisoners of conscience. It's absolutely immoral and unethical to be locking people up um, for these outdated, archaic drug laws that are damaging, um, damaging our society. We don't have a war on drugs. We have a war on some people who use some drugs. Uh, it's a kind of uh, an anachronism, and I think we'll look back on this as a as a bizarre legal blip in our historical record. Um, you know, like a uh, hundred years ago, in this country, uh, homosexuality was illegal, witchcraft was illegal, uh, but psychedelics were not illegal, and they were being used and written about by you know intellectuals and medical doctors and academics. Fast forward another 50 years, and you know, witch, witchcraft has even been repealed, as has uh, homosexuality. Uh, and somehow psychedelics are illegal, but it's just another cultural prejudice and bias. And uh, I think in time, we'll come out of this uh, brief period of the dark ages of cognitive liberty, and psychedelics will also be uh, legally available. I have no doubt we will look back in 5, 10, 20 years, however long it takes. We will look back at this period of history as the most awful, heinous political fo folly um, that locked people up and caused the destruction of society. Not the drugs, the drug laws themselves. We'll look back and hang our heads in shame at, at pursuing this crazy war on drugs. The longest war in the U.S. history is uh, being fought by uh, people like Leonard Picard. And someday we'll thank him. But at the moment, uh, he's about to complete 20 years in prison, which is a very, very somber uh, feeling, especially when you have no release date to keep in mind, you know. The feeling you have when you're facing a uh, life sentence is a very, very unique and different feeling. And there's nothing like going to court against the Drug Enforcement Agency with a uh, life sentence in front of you. Mm -hmm. Something which I enjoyed three months before Leonard. Um, I was acquitted, but Leonard wasn't. And it's because 9-11 happened between our trials, and there was no mercy in the heart of a jury by the end of 9-11. And uh, had it been sooner, he would have probably been released, because what jury wants to put a person in jail for two consecutive life sentences? You gotta be crazy, especially for not hurting anybody and just bringing light to the world. So once you're in the human warehouse, once you're locked up, you will start your appeals, which generally will get you nothing, um, and you just sit there and nobody thinks about you. So the, the law is the law, and it's really going to take an active populist movement to get it changed. Uh, people are going to have to be voted into office and others out of office based upon uh, reforming the criminal justice system, specifically the, the laws regarding drugs and psychedelics. The individual human stories though, like the story of Leonard's, really, really need to be put out. The story of people who in, say, North America are still in jail for life, for crimes associated with, you know, no violence, but simply the production or the distribution of marijuana, which of course has been decriminalised in other parts of the states. You know, so we really need to have like intelligent thought about this. We must not let those prisoners down. We must not just forget about them. 
I think we need to keep in touch with Leonard and tell him that there's uh, always hope and that we're trying very hard to get the mandatory minimum sentences altered and changed. I mean, the statement I always say is drugs don't kill people, prohibition does. I work as an addiction psychiatrist and every single case of drug harm and drug death I come across is as a result of the prohibition of that drug, not the pharmacology of that drug. So we have to fight fastidiously um, these cases because this needs to change. I think the policies surrounding uh, psychedelics are actually criminal uh, rather than the people that the policies are labeling to be criminals. And that's a tough sell for a lot of people that want to think that, uh, you know, we, we have this just world that we live in and we don't put people in jail for nothing. So even, even say you believe someone um, should be in jail for, for breaking the law and there's reasons why we have the, these laws, uh, one thing these policies do is make it so that scientists have a near impossible time legally researching psychedelics. Now, why wouldn't you research anything? Dr. David Nutt is a professor of neuropsychopharmacology at the Imperial College London. He was chair of the UK's advisory committee on the misuse of drugs until 2009. Uh, it's almost a uh, 10-year anniversary of my being fired by the government. I was a government uh, drug czar, the chief drugs advisor. And uh, I... I've been advising them for about 10 years as their sort of head pharmacologist. And in that time, we've done some pretty systematic, certainly the most detailed, transparent, systematic research on comparative drug harms has ever been done. Uh, the problem is it came to the wrong result. It showed that in Britain, alcohol was uh, way more harmful than the drugs that are vilified in the press, like MDMA and LSD and mushrooms. And, uh, when this report was published, I went on the radio and then the TV, and I, I told the truth. You know, I said alcohol is more harmful than LSD, and I got sacked because that was absolutely not a statement that the government could bear to have heard. Because he spent 50 years telling people how dangerous LSD was, and suddenly the chief scientist is telling them that they got it wrong. Temporary science, the way I, I view science, uh, is a way to look far beyond appearances uh, and to the immense complexity of, uh, of reality of what we know already and the immensity of what we don't know yet and the, the, the dream of, of, of knowing uh, more. The future of psychedelics, uh, it's only going to get weirder. <laughs> uh, we're discovering more of them, we're learning much more about them all the time. Um, we're learning how to use them uh, in the best and safest ways possible and we're discovering more and more potential beneficial uses for them uh, all the time as well uh, and I think in time the laws will, will change to, to, to fit the appropriate risk and potential benefit of these uh, extraordinary molecules. So in relation to psychedelics I'm really hopeful that uh, at the very least in the western uh, countries psilocybin will be uh, made a medicine rescheduled as a medicine within my lifetime and I'm 68 so I hope they do it quickly because I don't know how many more years I've got of course in other countries uh, particularly in uh, South Latin and South America you don't have the same problems as we have because you have uh, full access to the natural herbs like uh, ayahuasca which uh, makes things a bit easier but uh, my hope is that psilocybin will be a medicine in the UK within five years. If you had told me in 1970 that in my lifetime there would be same-sex marriage in the United States, I'd say, you're crazy. And when the movement started, I thought, well, this is going to take forever, and boom, it happened relatively quickly. Social change, and this is really social change we're talking about, can happen quickly, especially if the younger generations get active and politicians realize if they want their votes, they're going to have to open their minds a little bit. If you have the, the up of coke and the down of opium, then you have the weird of the psychedelic. And that weird, in that weirdness, lies the possibility of any number of types of radical action, social change, reimagination of the world. And the people who, who at least nominally believe that they are in control of the world fear this. And I think with psychedelics, they're a particular threat to any kind of established power because they make people question things. And questioning things 
um, takes power away from the people that are providing the narrative. They help question, people question things that they are involved with and identify with, and in the case of our world today, so much of power is about getting people to think that they're agreeing to things or believing in things or wanting things that are actually engineered. So there's a good YouTube video, The Engineering, or a series called The Engineering of Consent. And I think that psychedelics are like the antidote of engineering of consent because you're able to see, oh, these scripts came from somewhere. Like, I picked this up from culture. This isn't me. I don't want to participate in this. And that's a threat to the powers that be. Psychedelics are illegal because they allow us to see through the mask. But psychedelics in particular definitely encourage free thinking and people to question authority. And government, by its very nature and definition, wants people who don't question authority. And that includes what passes for democracy in the West. You know, a movement for social change can be measured by the way it treats its prisoners. And the movement for social change, uh, if it forgets its prisoners, it forgets, forgets itself. Mercy is the missing quality on earth right now. And uh, please, you know, show some mercy to this guy. I hope uh, now judges have the open-mindedness and the authority to, to realize and to take the right decision, which is to make an act. If Lena ever gets to see this, I wish you the best of luck and a great deal of love. And so I wish uh, that Leonard, uh, in his own lifetime, can be a free man again. Free Leonard Picard, please. Go to freeleonardpicard.org. That's free, freeleonardpicard.org. You can find his address. He loves to receive mail and to keep him in your thoughts. Psychedelics are slowly becoming mainstream and medicalization seems inevitable. But currently there are over 2,000 Americans serving life sentences in prison for non-violent drug charges. If you would like to know more about the Rosa Paracelsus and William Leonard Picard, please pick up a copy of his book and follow along with us as we dive into this literary work one chapter at a time on the Psychedelic Salon.